Who here has something to be thankful for? All right, quick, shout it out. Family. Family. Anybody else? It's okay. We can duplicate all day long. Janice? Gospel. Our nation. Jesus. Oh, what was that? Friends. Today, the scripture, scripture, scriptures. Love. Brothers and sisters in the faith. It's great. I'm thankful for you all. I'm thankful for all of those things. I know we do this. This is uh, cliche. It's traditional. What are you thankful for? And we, some of us dread Thanksgiving dinner because they're going to make us tell everybody what we're thankful for. And you try not to be the same old, same old. But, you know, the reality is that what we're shouting out here when we're quick in moments like that, there is actually in the court of law, I can't remember what the law is called, and I'm not a lawyer, but I heard this from a lawyer once, that um, hearsay is admissible under like very few conditions. And one of them is, again, the heat of the moment. So if witnesses heard somebody who watched an accident and someone got out of the car and they said, oh, I'm sorry, I was texting and I wasn't paying attention. In that moment, it was a moment of honesty. And so witnesses could then come to court and hearsay would be admissible in that if they could prove that it was that one short true moment. Sometimes we have trouble getting our emotions, like what is, what is it we really feel? But when we're thinking on our feet, you, really, you can really feel like you're being honest. Another action that you might take if you're with someone who's indecisive, I heard this once, you might take a coin and you may think that, oh, we're going to flip it in heads or tails and this is your decision. They got one or one of the other decisions. And the idea is I'm going to flip this coin and before it hits the ground, you have to make your decision. Most of the time we know what we want. Before that coin hits the ground, you're going to shout it out. That's the moment of truth. This morning is going to be about Thanksgiving. Our music and the things that, that we talk about are going to be about giving thanks. We have a lot to be thankful for, a lot to be thankful for. You will talk about those things in a little bit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore, always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of Christ Jesus concerning you. Will you please bow with me? Father, I pause, we pause at this moment to give you thanks. We thank you for all the things that were mentioned here, for the stories that have been in our history, and the opportunity to live in this dispensation of time, and for those of us who are in this place in the world at this moment. I thank you for placing us where, where we are. Why did you choose us to live in this country, to be raised by the people we've been raised by, to live in the homes we live in, in the community that we live, to have the opportunity for freedom when there are so many who suffer under oppression. So, Father, we're thankful for those things. We're thankful for the pain that we've had in our lives, which has brought us to you. We're thankful for those people who have been in and out of our lives, who have helped shape us and mold us into the people that we are today. We're thankful for the story of the restoration of the church and the miraculous nature in which you have operated in, in hit over the course of history in the lives of man. And we are most eternally grateful for the sacrifice of your son who gave us the opportunity to choose mercy and grace so that we could not suffer the demands of justice. We thank you for all these things and we seek you out because you are our God. You are our creator. You are our sustainer. You are everything, and without you, we are nothing. So thank you for who you are and what you are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
appreciate the work that went into getting that together. We should be thankful for that. I'm thankful as, um, I, I'll, so I guess I'm coming from this angle as a father. Um, yeah, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud that they stood there and sang. I look at um, Caleb and Vanessa. Um, they have their driver's licenses. Vanessa has a job. Um, they, they are, and others that were up here, uh, Jacob, Manu, Abby, Jera, some of the older kids, Olivia and Chloe, you guys have a choice, and you could do other things, but you chose to bring ministry today, and I appreciate that. It's difficult. I remember being 16. Um, it's hard to picture yourself doing something like that, and uh, just clicks at some point, you know what, I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, the opportunity, the fact that they're doing that, I'm grateful for that. I think it's outstanding. That in their, mo their point in life, that they're willing to come and give in meekness to us today. I wanted to, I have several things about Thanksgiving that I want to share. What was the, what's the most, what, what was the ship that set across in 1620? Okay, was it alone? Who else was with it? The Speedwell. The Speedwell. I'm not going to talk a lot about either one of those, but it's a neat story because there's one ship that overcame and there's one that couldn't. And I think there was actually shame in not being able to overcome with the Speedwell and the folks that were on it. Now, there were some who were ill and sick. And I don't want to say that because you get ill and sick and faint and you have to step out and step away that you are weak. However, was everybody well on the Mayflower? No. Was it a wonderful trip? <laughs> no. There was vomit on the deck, often. People were in the basement ill. This, um, how many weeks, months were they on the, on the water? 
can't remember, two or three months or weeks, two or three months, it was a long time, so 90 days, let's say 60 to 90 days they were on the water, what is that like? Now today, you go on a cruise ship, massive ship, we have bathrooms on those ships, so they have a sewage, they probably have a septic system somewhere on the ship, so it's compartmentalized, and worse comes to worse. That septic is not coming into that ship. It's going into the ocean if it really got to worse. So you would never have that issue. I doubt the Mayflower had that luxury. I doubt they had chlorine-filled pools. So even when your kid's like, I'm not bathing, <laughs> go, take, go, go swimming then. Oh, great. You didn't have that luxury either because you jumped in the only water that was there, the salt water, and you're probably left behind. This is the type of, type of stuff. So, so I'm going to share a story here in a minute from the New Testament where Jesus healed some people but he was heal, healing them from a really septic, disgusting environment. So that Mayflower had awful uh, bacteria, was just growing everywhere. Any disease that was brought onto that boat was not leaving that boat. It was going to pass from one person to another. So what these people did was absolutely astounding. They had no idea where they were. They knew they went to... Am I saying this correctly? The Dutch islands, is that right? They went to somewhere, and they found out that this isn't where we want to be, so they decided we're setting out for Virginia, and so that's where they began their journey, and they decided that that's where they wanted to go. They wanted to go to this new world. And we should all be grateful that they did. I tried to do some research on the Mayflower Com Compact, and, if you, and I found a bunch of stuff, a bunch of different stuff. And if you go to the history books, and you pull out a history book from, let's say, 15 years ago, they're going to tell you a different story about these pilgrims that came across. So it's very difficult. So I think it would behoove us at some point to have a class on what the true story is. For instance, why did they have this Mayflower compound? They had the compact. It was an agreement, a set of rules and laws. If you ask today's historian, the modern day, the millennial historian, they're going to tell you, well, it's because William Bradford wanted to control everybody with Miles Standish. And that's why that happened. And so the reason they went into this whole all things common type mentality and they tried to work together and live with each other was because they wanted to control. Well, we know what kind of government that is, but that's not the kind of government that they wanted to establish. They realized that we were a lot of people who have just come across on an awful journey. It was an awful journey. And I told you what was on the deck. It probably wasn't it. There was probably people who ended up being lost at sea because they passed away on the ship. There were probably bodies that were decomposing on the ship at times. They had to dispose of those and get rid of those. This was a, a horrible experience for these people. How many times have they thought, I know they said that we're going to this new world, and that this new world has all the stuff that we want from it. But how many times do you think the men and women on that boat thought, this is not what I thought it would be? I bet you daily. And they're stuck at sea. They can't do anything. How many people do you think thought, probably nothing there. I'm depressed. I'm tired. I'm sick. I might as well just jump ship right now. And I got a better chance trying to swim back back then hang it out hang, stick it out I bet that happened too so when we step back and look at our our movement our church as a whole work of God here we are we're on this work of God which is this ship of the Mayflower maybe that's barreling towards the promised land and we haven't seen the promised land little some of us have seen snippets of Zion We've sensed a little bit of the spirit that we think, oh, it's great. It's just a little bit, but we love it enough that we're, it keeps us hungry. But there's times where we sit in moments, and maybe we're in one of those moments now, you personally, where you're thinking, I don't know if I want to go on anymore. This is just too much of a pain. There's too much illness. There's too much confusion, and there's too much chaos, and I don't want to do it anymore. So Jesus in Luke chapter 17, he dealt with some of these people that were the dregs of society. Uh, they were the ones that nobody wanted anything to do with. They were lepers. I don't know a whole lot about leprosy, but I know that it's a gross disease. It's a painful disease, and it doesn't just go away. 
There is not a course for it to run. And I believe that the infections in those sores, Rachel, they can get into the bloodstream and then you're done. So back in Jerusalem, the cities were usually built up on a higher spot. And then anybody who they didn't like, the poor people were built, they encamped or built their shacks or whatever they did around the low places. And so these lepers were cast off. And they were cast off, usually at the bottom of the hill somewhere. And they probably set this little reservation for them. They set the boundaries. You can't, this is where you go. So you're diagnosed with leprosy. That's where you go. So you can imagine that there's sick people making sick people sick. It just never offered any health or relief for anybody. And they could probably come out occasionally, but people didn't want anything to do with them. They stayed back, and they were all alone in society. If you saw a leper walking on the side of the street, you would cross as far away from them so you couldn't catch any wind. You'd make sure you were upwind from them. So no matter what, you would get away from them. How would that make you feel if you were a leper? You didn't do anything to get this disease, and yet you have to suffer the awful um, retribution of mankind trying to just stay away from you. It would be a terrible way to live. One of the things that stands out to me about the way they lived, though, was that they were downstream. Sewer systems were pretty awesome back then. They're similar to what we had. They did have sewer systems. The water did run. They did channel. <laughs> um, I don't know if you, the men who've ever been to a public stadium or arena, you know what a urinal is. And they used to have long tubs and do their business there. And the water was just like that. In the public square, you would go in, and uh, the Romans were the ones that came up with this. And you would go, and you would take care of yourself, and then you would, the water would run. It was always running down. And so where did that go? That, all that water went down to the encampment where the lepers were. So now you have lepers getting sicker, making sicker people sicker. It got worse and worse and worse. Just a horrible way of life. So one time, there were these ten lepers. They're their only friends they have. Jesus from afar off, and they, they think, there is the Lord. He can heal us. It's interesting, if you read the scripture, they didn't go close to him. It says they saw him from afar off. They knew their place. They knew their requirement, that they were not to associate with the people. And so they had to be some kind of intimidation there, where they said, where they would say, you know what, that's Jesus I'm supposed to go next to that guy, let alone the Son of God. I had better stay away. So in Luke chapter 17, verse 11, it came to pass as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Galilee and Samaria. So we have the Samaritan lepers. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. But, in verse 13, they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So they knew who he was. They called out to him and said, have mercy on him, on us. And did Jesus heal them? Not directly, but yes, he did. His response was, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that they went and they were cleansed. So these men got what they wanted. Now I'm sure their faith is bolstered. They believe more than they've ever believed. Now they go to the priests, they're cleansed, and what would you be like? You're on the Mayflower, you don't believe, you know that there's a chance that you're not going to make it across the ocean. And finally you land, you port, everybody gets out, you smell the fresh air of the September weather, because that's when, I believe that's when they landed. Well, Alicia says whatever, <laughs> give or take 12 months, <laughs> it's close. <laughs> So, they, and you smell it, and you see all this green space, and all this land, and you've heard all this thing about it, and you, you've got to have joy, and your body takes heart, because now you see the promised land, now you've seen Jesus, now you know you can be healed, you can grow, you can have religious freedom, perhaps, you have an idea to set, you have an, a job, or an idea, a dream, that you can set something brand new, that's what these lepers are feeling, and what are you doing? Are you going to turn... To God in that moment, yes, some of them did. They turned to God and they said, thank you, we made it. Others 
rejoiced. They weren't evil in their rejoicing, but they rejoiced. They ran through. They built communities. They got to know the people. They got to know the land. They got to take advantage of the resources of the great Northeast. And they forgot to give God the thanks. These ten lepers did exactly the same thing. They went running away, telling everybody, I've been healed, I've been healed, except for one. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he started to run off with the ten. It says, he turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. If you have your scripture open, I love some of the nuggets that is put in our scriptures. This verse ends, and he was a Samaritan. It means he was, not only was he a leper, he was a Samaritan leper, which means he was worse than a Jewish leper. This man was awful. And they thought that Jesus cared enough about the Samaritan leper to heal him. And all the others, it doesn't say they were all Samaritans. It said, this one Samaritan that gave thanks. This one leper. We're awful judgy. We decide who can come in and who can't. When it comes to life after death, we, we get into those no, modes where we put on our whiteboards, and we didn't do that today. I'm not saying we did, but I've seen us done that, do this. We start to, we, we want to know the scriptures, so we figure out who goes where and when and how. And then, that's fine because the scriptures tell us those things, but then we get too busy trying to figure out who's a Samaritan and who doesn't belong. <laughs> And then we're in big trouble. This verse, this chapter, Luke 17, started out a little different, or started out with another story of giving thanks. It was a parable, but it probably is a true parable. How many of you having a servant? After your servant has worked your cattle all day long, and he's sweat, and he's bled for you, how many of you would invite him into your home and make him dinner? Jesus said, none of you. He said, what you would do, rather do, is you would say, you wouldn't even acknowledge the work that he'd done that day. When he walks into the house, you would say, I am hungry, I want to eat. And then your servant would go and make you dinner, because that's what you're paying him to do. And would you say thank you? How many of us, how many of you, need to hear thank you every once in a while? I do. I have several different bosses at my work, and the ones that really give me a hard time are the ones that I only get called in their office when I did something wrong or something didn't come out right. And I'm left wondering, the other 90% of the time or 95% of the time, was I doing good work? I don't know. I got to pat myself on the back. Then there's other bosses who are always telling me, you do a good job. I love getting called into their office, not because they tell me they do a good job, but because I know they're going to tell me when I'm wrong, and they're going to tell me when I'm right. How many of us have done that to our children? I have expectations of my children that they're going to do what they're supposed to do. I shouldn't have to say thank you for getting up and coming to church. I shouldn't have to say thank you for taking out the trash or because you live here too. We have that attitude where we don't want to say thank you because somebody doesn't deserve it or they should do what they're doing. God himself, Jesus said, in everything give thanks. Be thankful for what you do, for what you have. I'm thankful for three things. Many things, but I want to highlight three things that I think we should be thankful for. And it came up today in the adult class. I'm thankful for justice. I'm thankful for mercy. And I'm thankful for grace. And I hope you understand how neat it is that justice exists. We look at the Old Testament, it seems like a violent, vile, cold, coarse set of scriptures. And in many ways it is. But you can see the differences in the two two books, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why was the Old Testament the way it was? Do you realize that life could have been New Testament theology all the time? Adam and Eve, at the beginning of the story, made a mistake. And they withdrew themselves from God, and man had to suffer the wrath of justice. Until Christ could come and give us grace by the mercy of God. That's why the scripture 
to differ in their tone. That's why the Book of Mormon differs in the way it grows and as it ebbs and flows. You're seeing the difference between the demands of justice versus the luxury of mercy and grace. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. I had a thought as I was reading and praying this week. I'll share it with you whether it's scripturally sound or not. I hope it is because I think it's a neat thought. The Father is justice. The Spirit is mercy. And the Son is grace. Justice, grace, and mercy. Jesus gave us what we don't deserve. And the God gives us everything else. I'm thankful for those things. I'm thankful for the direction that we're heading. Because I know if we stay with Jesus Christ, all will be fine. I'm going to finish with a scripture in 2 Nephi. Right at the very end of this, of this book. I want you to think of yourself as a pilgrim if you can. You don't have to have the hat and the suit. You're in your shirt and pants just like your dress today, whether your kids like your pants or not. They tell me mine are ugly. I like blue. Well, however we're dressed, I want you to think of yourself as a pilgrim because we are on a journey. And we are moving toward a promised land. And we have an opportunity. You have a choice to make. You want to stay on the ship or do you want to bail? Do you want to give up? Do you want to press forward? Second Nephi chapter 13, verse 29. Wherefore, ye must press forward with the steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and the love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way, whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the only, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. In our thanksgiving this week, let us refocus, and let us resolve within ourselves to endure to the end, to see the literal city of Zion be built in our lifetime. Let us resolve to be the most righteous people that our church has ever seen in its history. Let us resolve that together we will spend however long it takes in fasting and prayer, seeking and expecting God to reveal himself to us. I believe that if we were to do this, God would bless us in ways that we cannot even imagine. Our wildest dreams would come true and many, many more that we haven't even fathomed yet. Let us make those resolutions as we come on the new year, as we lead up to the new year. Let us today resolve to stay in the boat, to get on the right course, and to endure to the end. Paula? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Enter his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Thank you.
us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. As I was sitting there listening to Chris, I um, remembered that a miracle, Thanksgiving miracle, took place in this building. Um, I think it was back here where the old um, part of the building was. Um, it was Thanksgiving during the um, uh, Depression, and people didn't have a lot of things. But the congregation had set a Thanksgiving service, and they were going to have a potluck Thanksgiving meal afterwards. And so the service got started, and the, the church was just filled to overflowing with people. And the women downstairs looked at the food, and they said, there's no way <laughs> that we're going to feed all these people. And so they told the pastor, and he said, well, we'll just have to pray over it and see if the Lord can bless it. So they prayed over that food. They fed everyone and sent home extras with everyone. It was the loaves and fishes experience. Chris said this morning, as we look at ourselves, And the call that we have to love each other and to have his kingdom among us. We can say, Lord, there's not enough. We don't have the resources. We're not the kind of people we need to be. But that same kind of miracle can happen among us through his spirit it will be enough and more than enough to do the things that he's calling us to do to be the people that he's calling us to be to allow his spirit to work with us and allow his kingdom to be among us
turn to hymn three, hymn number three, great and marvelous. This will be one of three. Please stand. Please stand and turn to hymn number 16. So just stand at the moment and get your hymn. This will be our closing hymn. Sorry, hymn number 516, 516.
Would you please be seated one more time? I will close this with a prayer in a moment. Um, we need to take up the offertory, and um, this is what you get when you put me in charge of something like that. You forget things, and I forgot that. I'm sorry. Uh, would those men come forward? I don't think a whole lot needs to be said about the offertory uh, today. Are you thankful? Are you grateful? Hundreds of years ago, we were given a blessing when this land was discovered. Your ancestors decided to find this new world at whatever point they found it. I hail from Norway and Germany and Sweden and who knows where else. I'm sure there's others in here who come from similar places or others. We come from all over the world. The United States is a melting pot. We stand in a vast amount of wealth. We hear a lot about 1%. I don't think we have any 1%ers here. It'd be nice if we did. But they give us wealth. I complain often about the amount of money that I don't make. But yet, I've been to other countries and I've seen pictures and heard stories. And I know that even in this land, there are people who are destitute. Children who are being raised in homes where parents are not able to provide for them for one reason or another or unwilling. And there are many, many needs that God would love to use you to provide for. So as this offering is taken up, as you reach forward with your hand, how grateful are you? How happy and content are you truly in life? And how much has God truly blessed you? Father, we thank you for the blessings which we've been given. There's none in here who can say truly that our life has been full of misery. Perhaps a large majority of it in many cases, but we've been blessed by your hand. I know that I did not choose to live in the United States, to be born here. And I'm grateful for the opportunities that you've laid before me because of my rights as the citizen of this great country. I'm thankful for the sacrifice of your son and the opportunity he extended to all of us and to me to be a citizen of his kingdom. I pray that as we stretch forth our hands today and give, that you would bless us with true gratitude, humility, that we would go forward in meekness, recognizing that we are strong and powerful because we are your children, but yet we are humble and we will reign in that power and use it only for your honor and your glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Kyle, would you offer a benediction on us? Our Father in heaven, we come before thee at the close of this service today, giving thanks and praise for the things that we were reminded of, for the things that we need to be thankful for. Father, we truly are thankful for the gospel and for the knowledge that we have of thee. We love thee and we want to serve thee. We want to give thee praise and we want to give thy son praise. We're thankful, Father, for the wonderful gift that thou hast given to us of thy son that we can continue to have eternal life from the great knowledge that we have. Please be with us today that we'll be able to have thy spirit with us. Dismiss us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.